Hi, so uh, my name is Ajahn Tom again. <laughs> I'm from McGill University. I'm doing my master's in uh, music technology. My background is in electrical engineering and uh, quite a bit of music production. So this is my first AES conference and uh, I'm presenting about automatic mixing in front of audio engineers and I'm really not nervous. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so basically yeah, the context is uh, you have multi-track content and uh, you want to perform some sort of automatic mixing and my focus here is uh, spatialization in the terms of uh, panning these multi-track sources in your stereo field. And uh, so sound engineers have this, this pan pot available to pan sources, whereas here I'm using a frequency-based spreading sort of technique and, uh, and I'll be presenting about the same. Right. So just to set a little bit of context about automatic mixing, uh, so we have a lot of unprocessed audio material which has to go through equalization, panning, and dynamic compression, etc. And these production tasks can be challenging, technical, and time-consuming, especially if you're a musician with not much of background in uh, music production. It's, uh, it's pretty hard, or uh, it's hard to, maybe you don't have budget to uh, go to a mix engineer and mix the same. So for such applications, I feel automatic mixing is a very good tool for, for a good starting point. In the context of multi-channel audio, you have uh, the laser work. Yeah. So basically, you have audio input coming in, and it has to, uh, and you do a lot of feature extractions, and then you apply your feature processing. And this could be based on a lot of constraints, based on psychoacoustics or best practices that sound engineers use, or machine learning if nothing works out. And uh, then we apply these parameters to our whole signal chain, and we have our final uh, stereo mix. So in the case of multi-channel, the difference is that there is a lot of interaction between these tracks. So we can't apply the features just based on looking at one individual track. We have to see how these tracks interact, and then come up with the final signal processing required. So what's the main challenge in, uh, in, the, in the case of automatic mixing? Well, it's, it's hard to make the machines here like we humans do. So we have to consider perception. And uh, so this means that we have to de develop our algorithms with both uh, uh, keeping in mind both objective as well as perceptual criteria. And uh, automatic mixing is not just a thing of studio. You could have a live music performance and you want to quickly try out different uh, automatic mixing tools. So which means we have to take care of uh, real-time operability. So, in, so past works have basically looked at, uh, they have analyzed spectral content and decided a panning amount for each track. And uh, here I'm going for a different approach. So basically if you categorize automatic mixing, one, one being trying to mimic what sound engineers actually do. Or on the other hand, I have a different approach in the sense, say we have, we are using a very complex process which sound engineers might not be able to achieve in finite time on their door, for example, frequency-based panning, so they don't have that much access. I mean, you can do it, it might take a lot of time because if you want to do frequency-based panning, you have to EQ each track, then uh, send them to your st different studio bus left and right, and that's going to take a lot of time. So in this context, autom automating the whole process might be useful. So yeah, both these kinds of uh, automatic mixing uh, methodologies are good as long as we are able to get a good sounding mix. Right, so my approach was to look at the best practices in panning. So, uh, so panning is an iterative process. You don't, you don't get audio content and you decide for each track, I'm going to put 20% uh, left and 80% right. No. There's a lot of interaction between these tracks, so which means you have to look at the whole multi-channel multi audio and then decide different features. Now, uh, in the low frequencies, is best kept centered. You don't want any uh, spatial or spectral imbalance. You don't want to hear a lot of bass on one side and high frequencies on, on the other side. So which, we want the low frequencies to be centered. So mid frequency is where you want to target and uh, you know reduce your amount of masking, <coughs> which means where you want to spread them, spread these sources in the mid frequency across the stereo field. And uh, as we go higher up in the frequency, we can afford to uh, pan with higher width. And one th main thing to keep in mind: uh, maintaining the overall stereo picture, which means again you don't want to lo lose spatial balance by using all these. So that's a major constraint. And this sometimes might be hard for a sound engineer to achieve in the sense, like as, as we go across time, we might have a lot of spatial imbalances because, I mean, automating is possible, of course, but it's pretty a tiring process sometimes, and it takes time. So in this context, again, automating this process, which is, of course, like, you don't automate all the creative processes, but these are technical aspects which can be automated, so it's good. 
And I didn't make this up, these are all references from where I got these uh, best practices. And so my first step to my automatic mixing uh, algorithm is to detect spectral masking. So basically, I use the intertrack, I use an intertrack similarity measure between, I compare each track with every other track, and I see, I try to see where there's a lot of similarity. So for example here, the electric guitar and the organ has a lot of spectral similarity. And I also check for uh, how much each instrument has been, each source has been masked with respect to the rest of the mix. So using this, I am able to make a spectral correlation map in which I know that this, this pair, this track pair is where I have to, is whom I have to spread across the stereo mix and release from masking. And then comes acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and so on. And for a more visual representation, so for the organ and the electric guitar, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, spectral bins which are overlapping and which surely led to masking. Now, uh, so complaint to perception, as I mentioned before. So, uh, I mean, one obvious technique, if, as, now that I mentioned I'm doing frequency panning, we might think that why not we just take every bin and start placing them alternately in the stereo field. Well, but I tried that and we can't perceive it. So, which means we have to comply to perception. So I used Bach scale bands to achieve the same. So we have reducing uh, frequency resolution as we go higher up in the frequencies. So because of this, I made, uh, I developed these panning filters, which are basically sinusoids in the, in the, bulk, in the ERB domain. But once I convert them to the linear domain, I get these, uh, uh, these kind of windows, which are similar to these auditory filters of the human ear. So you can see this is a crude example of how a track would be panned. You can see uh, alternate frequency bands are being spread across the stereo field. This is a good example. This is not how it's actually implemented, but this is an example just to show you what the frequency panning is. So as we go higher up in the frequency, larger bands are spread across the field. And uh, finally, I uh, used this uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, optimization algorithm called the particle song optimization, mainly because I have a lot of uh, a lot of particles to deal with in the sense here, each particle would be the panning filter for each track. And uh, based, my, my cost here being multi-track masking, and uh, the constraints being the best practices of panning, which I'll explain soon. And uh, why particle sound optimization? Because that is very similar to the kind of uh, process that sound engineers use. It's a very iterative process. And you have a lot of parameters to control, the amplitudes and the panning offsets of these panning filters. And yeah, so now again, revising the best practices, we want the low frequencies to be centered. Mid frequencies where you want to apply your uh, song optimization to spread your mix. And so this is the final result of the optimization. So basically, my, uh, this optimization led to three things. In the low frequencies, I ended up with uh, no panning which means I have a good uh, spatial balance that low frequencies are not banned. And the mid frequency you can see here, so this, each color represents the panning filter for each track pair. And uh, each of these track pairs would be panned alternately. So which means you can see, like, these peaks would mean that, the, the, uh, like for example, for source number one at 500 hertz, I have, uh, I place that in the studio field and the masked pair would be in the opposite direction, like this. And uh, so going to the block diagram, block diagram, so first I perform short-time Fourier transform. I, uh, I check for masking, so masking detection, and remember the spectral similarity map that we developed. So based on this, I apply it to my particle swarm optimization, and the constraints are uh, spatial balance, uh, spectral balance, and uh, uh, no, no panning in the low frequencies. And then finally, I apply each of these spectral modifications with, the, uh, uh, with each of the track, and then I perform inverse period transform and add all of them up. And uh, now for some results. So the electrical engineer in me wanted to plot all these graphs, so um, we can look at the panning activity. So I basically compared a sound engineer mix versus past auto mix works in panning. And uh, these last two are my implementations, one of them being the real-time implementation, and one of them being the uh, optimized implementation. And uh, these are goniometer plots in which you can see like the, the spread is a bit low in 
um, past Automix works, whereas the last two are mine, in which we can see good amount of stereo activity. And uh, yeah, and uh, these are some metrics which I'll talk about if I have time later. And yeah, so being an audio engineer, I also wanted to trust the ear more than trusting those graphs. So I conducted a subjective evaluation listening test in which uh, I uh, chose a lot of tracks from the open multi-track test bed. And uh, there, and in the mixed browser evaluation toolkit, there were a lot of, uh, lot, lot of mixes with a lot of uh, subjective ratings. And I chose the tracks which had uh, the tracks of the sound engineers who had maximum uh, points when it came to uh, uh, spa uh, spa uh, spatialization. So I chose that track as a reference to my, for the sound engineer mix. And I also compared those tracks after running through the, uh, through past Automix works. And I also compared uh, my Automix algorithms against all of these for different genre. So for folk, country, I just chose some of these genre. And as you can see the results over here, of course, like the sound engineer mix was the best. On the, on the other hand, my automatic uh, optimized algorithm managed to be at par with the sound engineer mix for most of the genre. Real time mix performed well, but was pretty variant in terms, it was, it was not showing very uh, optimized results. And here are some subjective comments. So for the optimized auto mix, some, some comments were uh, it had a very clean centered image well-balanced and could hear each instrument distinctly. Whereas for my real-time auto mix, so for the real-time automatic mixing, there was no uh, optimization applied. Rather, it was just uh, based on the spectral similarity map in which I placed every uh, track pair across the stereo field. Still, it did a pretty okay job, but not as good as the optimized one. And uh, to get an idea of what the listening test looks like, it's uh, the Web Audio Evaluation Toolkit developed by members of uh, Center for Digital Music. So here, uh, so basically I asked them to rate the tracks uh, based on uh, uh, spatialization, clarity, and uh, spatial balance. And uh, yeah, so basically they have preference from low to high. And uh, so basically, uh, I conducted some pilot test in uh, Queen Mary University, and after that, I hired uh, 20 sound engineers from McGill University who had uh, more than uh, 20 years in 20 years, 20 years of experience in music production. And uh, I presented them with headphones and these tracks, and they could click on them, and they could listen to it. For example, so this is like this is the mono sum of all the all the sources. Yeah, so they could just uh, place them across the preference scale and, and that's how I got these results. And uh, oh, um, um, on these speakers, I'm pretty sure you can't see the difference, but on headphones you can clearly see quite, quite, uh, quite a good amount of difference. And, uh, so, yeah, so now I can show you some uh, goniometer plots of how these things look like. So, so if I look at the mono sum, for example. So of course the goniometer won't react much because it's mono. Now if I choose uh, the human mix, so there is some amount of uh, panning activity across the stereo field. Now we can compare against mine. Yeah, so you can see the stereo activity here is pretty more uh, sparse and across the studio field and has a good stable center image. I think you can see clearly now. Yeah. And for the real time mix, it is something like this. Yeah, I mean, we don't look at this, but if you want to hear it, you can come to me and I can show you how these things sound like. Um, is your panning dynamic? I mean, in the sense that it's time varying? I mean, because I guess you're doing this in frames, so each frame would have a different pan solution. So is it sort of going ping, 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 ping? Mm -hmm. Or doing it over the whole piece and statically saying, yeah, I'm going to put the, the drums there? Right. Okay. So, so basically, um, the way I implemented, based on past works, they've shown that uh, a two second a uh, smooth window over time right. gave good changes. So I did. It's dynamic. 
and also I made sure one thing that once a track gets a certain direction, I won't change it from there. So once a track in the beginning, if it moved to the left, because of my optimization, I made sure that it never goes to the right, even though the optimization want to take it right. So if a guitar ended up, if some frequency bands of a guitar ended up on the left side, it will stay there and it will move along the stereo field between say minus one to zero. Right. So it is dynamic here. Yeah. Okay. Um, related to that, is it also frequency dependent? <coughs> so you might have the low bits of the guitar there and the high bits over there, or did you keep the whole guitar together? Oh yeah. So that's a good question. And. Uh, so there were some handcrafted uh, parameters that I chose based on informal listening test. So I wanted to make sure that you don't want to uh, destabilize the whole uh, source's image by spreading them randomly across the studio field, so that's not good. The width of my windows I chose such that in the mid-frequency area, like the most, uh, most important spectral bands of an instrument stay to one side. So I actually can show a quick demo of how I chose that. So it's something like this. So imagine I have a guitar track. So uh, I made sure that. So as you can see, like only from this area I started my random panning, because these are not empirically very relevant sources, which will uh, make me realize that okay, this the, in, the center image of the guitar is on that side. So these high frequency elements I, I randomly spread all across the stereo field in a very harsh sense, but. What I made sure is on the center is the uh, the main uh, timbrical, timbrically important content. So this whole image would stay on one side. Mm. Yeah. So this is something which I want to make sure because or else it it, it will be uh, the whole stereo field will be pretty blurred. Mm. And uh, so yeah. So basically, I wanted to achieve these three things over here with my panning filters. My low frequency stayed in the center. Mid frequency, I had such a amount of panning as we can see in that graph over there where the, the most of the panning happened in that mid-frequency area. And the high frequency, I didn't care much about the image being in, in one place. I could afford to spatialize them all across the field. And that's what led to the spatialization factor being high in my mix. 